Elia, Introduction Classical antiquity played host to a great intellectual struggle. Philosophers, possessed by the desire to know, engaged in free inquiry and developed an astounding array of positions. They formed schools and engaged each other in philosophical debates. That same spirit grips our generation. We gather online to develop our beliefs and to clash like rams. Antiquity is born again, beautiful and new. This text is part of that online culture. It is the culmination of a project previously known by the titles Pseudo Agisaleos, The Codex, and Journey to Monism. The content stems from online discussions on sites such as the RPG Codex, Twitter, and Lit. That online forum and gamer heritage is reflected in the author's effort to make the text clear and accessible. Those who appreciate CRPGs should be able to understand this work regardless of their philosophical background. They should feel at home exploring the world and meeting the non-player characters. This book is a timeless opportunity to visit a distant community of philosophers who live in and around a large temple. You might open the book explore the temple grounds, engage in philosophical discussions, and then retire to the guest house. In this book you have your own little Eleatic retreat, a place where you can stretch your legs and consider your position on metaphysics and morality. The text begins with your arrival at the temple, located in a remote valley. The community in and around the temple is chiefly inspired by ancient Hellenic and Chinese works. In particular, the Eleatic Fragments, and certain Taoist texts. This book is primarily focused on metaphysics and morality. The adherents of the temple seek to establish a broad metaphysical framework that will provide context for any issue one might consider, and to secure an objective basis for ethical judgments. I now skip the remainder of the introduction, only pausing to read one sentence from the middle and then the, the last sentence of the introduction. The story can end in several ways. If the rules are followed, it is not possible to see all the content in one read-through. And now the last sentence of the introduction. With any luck, this text will bring us all closer to a coherent understanding of reality, and in doing so expose the inferior teachings that clutter our online communities. The Arrival you hike along a forested path, occasionally catching sight of your destination through the towering trees and dense foliage. It was an easy decision to make this journey. After listening to one too many theological debates, you decided something more certain than talk of gods and their plans for humanity. You set out after encountering a forum post that revealed a greater context to reality, one that stretched beyond the gods and swallowed them whole. Or was it the desire for independence in a new social order that led you here? The role of a lawgiver always appealed to you, but it never appeared in your job searches. Instead, you caught glimpses of it when reading wondrous science fiction novels and ancient accounts of new colonies and kingdoms. Soon enough, you were signing up to online forums, eagerly discussing planned communities and space missions. You eventually spotted a post about a temple located in a remote valley. Here was a chance to unshackle yourself from the wayward institutions and authorities of the present. Could this place enable you to live life in accordance with your true nature? Is it here that you will finally engage in some project that gives you a sense of fulfillment? Whatever the motivation, it has succeeded in drawing you here. Refreshed by the walk and full of hope, you stand before the Eleatic Temple, the entrance is marked by large double doors made of wood, set into a red wall topped by dark ceramic tiles. In front of the doorway stands a wooden table with a stack of pamphlets. Two individuals sit there, eyeing you. They are dressed in comfortable robes, sipping from mugs of tea. As you move closer, the two people stand and greet you. Welcome to our temple. This site is dedicated to our philosophical project, inspired by the Eleatic Sages and the great minds of the Mystery School. 
We seek the broadest possible understanding of what is and explore the constitution of all things. For newcomers like yourself, we offer a printed welcome guide. It will introduce you to our project, provide you with a map of the temple and the surrounding valley, and hopefully eliminate confusion and make your visit more enjoyable. Please take a copy and read over it before you enter. The temple consists of several buildings and extensive grounds. This entrance leads directly to the Grand Hall, which connects to a series of exhibits and our public canteen. Today, we are serving lamb soup. We highly recommend stopping by for a bowl. The price of the meal is conversation. A room will also be prepared for you at our guest house. Most of our guests like to stay here for a while and take part in our activities. During your visit, please let others know your thoughts. Those who maintain this temple are happy to talk with you. Conversation has its own benefits, distinct from impersonal words written for a broad audience. Perhaps you might even develop your own contributions to our school of thought. As with anything in the human realm, there are some rules. Please dress in a conservative manner, and be sure to cover any exposed tattoos and remove excess piercings. Please refrain from drinking alcohol or consuming other intoxicants, except for when you are visiting the canteen or the grove. We would also prefer that you drink tea instead of bean water. Please try to speak only Chinese and English, and please avoid spelling words in an unpleasant fashion. When referencing historical examples, do your best to focus on Hellenic and Chinese antiquity. Finally, Please understand that we reject the confused standards of the current dissolute era. After listening to the speech, you take a copy of the welcome guide. It is a folded pamphlet with a map printed on the back. You place it in your inventory, where you may review it at will. To review documents collected during your visit, see your inventory on page 290. Choices. Inquire about the rules. Inquire about the welcome guide. Thank them and proceed into the temple. Um, let's just ask them a quick question. I won't ask them both questions. Let's go with uh, inquire about the rules. Initial inquiries one. After patiently listening, you ask about the need for such rules. What is wrong with wandering around naked, your body covered in tattoos or pierced with holes? Why should you drink tea instead of coffee? Why only reference Hellenic and Chinese antiquity? The two men listen to your questions quietly, one of them with a stern expression, the other with a warm smile. When you are finished, the one man's smile breaks into a laugh. He places his mug down and raises both hands in mock surrender before responding. Like any other society, we have rules that prohibit dangerous and disruptive behaviour. We would also like to create a sense of familiarity and a shared identity. We feel this is conducive to the harmony and success of our society. Hence, we created a few rules that one might consider a matter of taste. We could formulate some explanation for why tea is the superior beverage, or cite some injunction against the consumption of beans, but that's not the point. We were raised to prefer tea, and would like to encourage its consumption and we hope that people will be brought together by their shared appreciation for it. The world will reflect our will, and our members will share common ground. Not to mention the health benefits inherent to tea consumption, of which you'd be a fool to ignore. Most of the rules also uphold classical standards, and give people an opportunity to display their membership in our society. In antiquity, what sort of man willingly scarred his body with tattoos or excessive piercings? Within the traditions we appreciate, that sort of thing was only fit for savages, slaves, and criminals. I've heard it said that our bodies, to every hair and bit of skin, are received by us from our parents, and we must not presume to injure or wound them. This is a beginning of filial piety. The man pauses as he picks his mug up and takes a sip. He then adopts a somewhat more serious tone, continuing. If you absolutely insist on drinking coffee and engaging in other unwise behavior, I suppose you can still go in. Even I have been known to act unusually at times. There's no shortage of philosophers who want to buck the trend, 
and most of us can appreciate that outsiders have different ideas. Some of our own members like to gather in the grove and push social boundaries. Perhaps they'll give you a favorable reception if you catch them at the right time. The man then breaks out with another wide smile before directing your attention to the entrance gate. As you consider your options, the two men sit quietly, watching you. Choices. Inquire about the welcome guide, or enter the temple doors. Uh, well, we promised to read the welcome guide, so... Well, we didn't promise, but they told us to before we enter. So let's take a quick look at it. Uh, it was page 290. This would be easier if I had a printed copy. I don't. Um, but let's go down. Here we go. So we'll look at the outside of it first. Welcome guide. You examine the outside of the pamphlet. It has an attractive illustration on the front cover consisting of people in various outfits engaged in conversation. Flipping it over, you see something of practical use, a map of the temple grounds. Table of contents. So the map is essentially the table of contents. I don't need to read that. Let's look at the interior. Welcome to the Eliatic Temple. Situated in a remote valley, our philosophical community is centered around a large complex that we call the Eliatic Temple. Inside the main structure, you will find a public canteen, meeting hall, and various exhibition rooms and offices. There is also a nearby guest house and many smaller cabins. Guests and tour groups are welcome to rest here during their visit. Our community is also responsible for the rest of the valley. You may find extensive hiking trails, a collection of statues and other artwork, and public fields and groves. We invite you to explore the natural beauty and engage with the people you encounter during your stay. Our community was founded many generations ago by those who rejected the prevailing institutions and beliefs of their day. Their common views, hobbies and aspirations brought them together, and after necessary preparations they set out for this valley. The land was not uninhabited, but the locals were soon convinced to accept the leadership and philosophical beliefs of the new order. We graciously allowed these people to continue living in the lands around our temple. They follow our community in all matters of broad importance, but are otherwise left to their own devices. Today, they form an important part of the valley's culture and provide our community with many useful products and services. Since the founding of the site, we have kept it open to outsiders and have occasionally introduced promising new members into our ranks. However, there are also those who come here cap in hand, or with malicious intent. You may find them and their descendants enjoying a form of serfdom. This practical method of integration allows us to incorporate people who lack either an autochthonic connection to the valley, or the philosophical spirit necessary for membership in our community. We help them focus on their most useful strengths. Vagrant college graduates might spend their days copying and translating texts we provide them, while the learned farmers can plough the fields and keep a share of the harvest for their own use. I will skip ahead. The welcome guide has got a, another few pages to go. Let's read the last paragraph here. It is blessing enough that we can know the perfect and complete nature of being with absolute certainty. This broad wisdom fills us with confidence and the ability to persevere through any success or failure. We need not mourn the past, for it remains safe and secure where we left it. As for what one might term the future, we can accept both our successes and our failures, for both are present in complete measure in the fullness of time. An ode reads, In fear and trembling, as if approaching a deep abyss, as if walking on thin ice, we both respect and go beyond such concerns. Locations the Welcome Guide then lists a number of locations and gives a brief description. I'm not going to read through it. After reading the pamphlet carefully, you fold it back up and put it away. As you do so, you notice a map on the back cover, entitled Table of Contents. You can always take it out again, should the need arise. Okay. So let's go back to where we were. We listened to the two people at the door and read part of the Welcome Guide at least. And we can go in. Hold on. Again, I wish I had a 
print a copy that I could flick through easily. Proceed into the temple, page 174. <clears throat> Boundary of Coherence The entrance opens to reveal a short colonnade, lined with red pillars and a low, ornate fence. You walk across to another set of double doors, appreciating the gardens and stone-lined ponds that surround the path on either side. You feel at once like you are both indoors and outdoors, a place in nature that is also civilized and ordered by human hands. Opening the second set of doors, you step over the sill and enter a large room with a vaulted ceiling. Other than the light that flows in behind you, the room is completely dark. As your eyes adjust, you start to make out a solitary figure standing in the center. The man does not acknowledge your arrival. He appears to be preparing himself to give some sort of performance. When the man begins loudly reciting a monologue, you decide to lean against the wall and quietly listen. I am talking about something. For what is the alternative? I cannot reference anything that is not, for it would necessarily bear some significance and therefore constitute something that is. If the thing I point to has no significance... How can I be said to have pointed at it? How can I even say it, for that affirms it as present, singular, and perceived? My awareness is characterized by is. The flood of existence swallows me whole. What is, is omnipresent and inescapable. Everything I know invariably falls within the breadth of being. I cannot claim otherwise, for by definition I cannot identify any alternative to being. The claim that something is independent from being or beyond being? Such words are just incoherent strings. They cannot point away from what is. This omnipresent ontology necessarily consumes all facets of my experience. I cannot tear myself away from the complete, inescapable, and all-subsuming whole. We talk about what is, for that is all there is to talk about. I cannot compromise, I cannot offer an alternative. There is but one path of truth, and you shall walk it by my side, or see your words reduced to gibberish. I have heard it said that if one stands on a different planet, they could use a lever to shift this one. Yet there is no location beyond being where one might retreat, no externality one might leverage to influence or alter what is. The dominance of being is so complete that any supposed whisper of independence is immediately exposed as incoherent nonsense. There is no alternative to being, no way out of this all-subsuming context of existence. I must therefore reject the suggestion that things might be more or less real, for there is no alternative substance that might be introduced to dilute the purity of what is, nor burnt off to concentrate it. Wherever you point, there it is, pure and untainted. Being is well poured and constitutes absolutely all information. Whatever is possible is most assuredly necessary. For if something can be, then it must be, for there is only one path where we saw it, that it is. That path, being, is the omnipresent and perfect whole. Where did being come from? Where will it go? Such questions are absurd. Every conceivable location, every conceivable arrangement, these are all within its breadth. What was it, and what will it become? These questions similarly devolve into incoherence. If I say that what is will become something else, I am referencing the something else as though it were separate from what is. Yet there is no alternative to being, no external something else that might be sought beyond the is. The flood of existence swallows any notion of an alternative. Further, what would become of what was? For the initial arrangement or state of what is had significance, and we have no other place where we might hide it. All significance is necessarily preserved by the inviolate nature of being. Any proposed chronology of events 
must exist in a complete state. Any moment is as real and inviolate as any other. The ball at the top of a hill and the ball at the bottom of a hill are two distinct arrangements, and we might chart out the path between them. Yet to create or destroy arrangements is no less incoherent than to create or destroy any other modicum of significance. The permanent ball is permanently smeared across the entire surface of the permanent hill. The chronology is complete and secure. I must confess that change is limited and relative, fastened in place by chains of necessity. Any talk of time and change is merely descriptive of something that has always been here. I am subsumed by being, am I not? So my existence is permanent and secure. I will live forever. I cannot be destroyed. There is no alternative. I am invincible. No force can shift me from my, my place. Strike me down. I am still there. I remain where you saw me. You, my aggressor, you are still there, chained by my side. Stop struggling. Even the gods cannot fight against necessity. You are distracted from the monologue by the sound of a door creaking open. Light begins to flood into the room from the far end, and you can make out a figure standing there. This new person signals for you to approach. He then begins to speak. Come, let me show you something more specific. As interesting as you might find, my brother, he has a one-track mind. He sees what is, but has hardly begun to chart its complex constitution. If you want to know its richness of detail, just follow me. Our main exhibits are open to the public, and I'd be happy to give you a guided tour. As you ponder his words, you notice another corridor leading out of the room. A barely illuminated sign reads, Canteen. Thoughts of lamb soup force their way into your mind. Choices. Accompany the man. Object to the monologue and express some concerns. Decline and go in search of food. Well, let's get some food. Let's not argue with the man or, or go on a long tour of the exhibits on an empty stomach. So we will decline and go in search of food. Page 47. Here we are. Generally in this read-through, I'm going to avoid the more detailed discussions and just have kind of a a light-hearted tour, get some food, maybe take a nap, and then retire to the guest house. Lamb soup in. You excuse yourself and proceed down the corridor towards the canteen. As you get nearer, you hear the chaotic sounds of people eating and chatting. You also detect the scent of food, causing your belly to rumble and your feet to pick up the pace. The canteen is still partially under construction. It currently consists of a serving area and several tables and benches. A long sliding panel opens out to a large meadow and forested grove. Several groups of people are gathered outside and appear to be enjoying the fresh air. You queue up and grab a bowl of lamb soup, pour yourself a cup of tea, and find a seat. A nearby diner noisily slurps down the last of his meal before introducing himself to you. You look hungry. Eat up. This stuff will hit the spot. The ingredients are all fresh from this morning. We grow it and raise it all near my village. Most of us come here each morning to help with the construction and expansion of the temple. It's hard work, but at least we get to enjoy some decent food, right? The adherents also seem to appreciate this canteen that we run. It's not like any of them know how to cook as well as us. I assume the bloke in the main hall tired you out, right? He has a way of doing that to people, droning on about how literally everything exists. Then, when you decide to push back, his friend comes in from the exhibit room and starts giving you a hard time. Honestly, if the all-is-one bloke wants to express the omnipresence of existence, he should just stop talking. Omnipresence overflows all boundaries and distinctions. If he keeps trying to describe existence in particular terms, he will invariably stray from the truth. For in describing it one way, he cuts some other way out of the picture. If we wish to talk about everything, we ought to be silent, don't you agree? 
The man grabs a nearby teapot to refill your cup. As he pours, you notice, you notice a white jade bracelet on his wrist. It is engraved with the image of a woman, surrounded by wild animals. You tap your fingers politely on the table, and the man places a teapot back down. As you open your mouth to respond to his question, you are interrupted by the drunken ramblings of a man several rows over. He is loudly giving an um impromptu lecture to some of his friends. Choices Smile politely and excuse yourself, heading outside to the grove. Agree with the man and ask how we can speak about specific details. Offer a thoughtful nod and then head over to the drunken lecture. Well, let's um, let's just go out to the grove. We had our lamb soup and our cup of tea. So smile politely and excuse yourself, heading outside to the grove. We're not going to talk to this guy or listen to the drunken lecture. Grove. You step out onto a stone patio, where you are greeted by a cloudy blue sky and broad meadow. It's not quite what you would call a grove, although it is surrounded on several sides by forests, and there are some dense clusters of trees spread throughout. The air is clear enough for you to make out the mountains in the distance, the rocky outcroppings collared by dense rings of pine. You also spot several small settlements in the distance. Gatherings of people are scattered throughout the immediate area. Some groups are just sitting down for a picnic, but you also see large crowds mingling and watching performances. One large group in particular catches your eye. It is separated into two opposing camps, and you can see two speakers engaging in some sort of oral debate. There are quiet spots for those who desire privacy, too. A few great trees stand alone, providing an ideal shaded spot for a nap. Perfect for someone who has just enjoyed a full meal at the canteen, or a few drinks and interesting conversation with friends. Furthest away, close by the tree line, you see people working out and sparring at an outdoor gymnasium. The available, the available equipment is simple but sufficient. Weights of varying sizes and hanging bars, and a long grassy track for those eager to get in their cardio. A colonnade and small building provide shade for those recovering from their exertions. Choices Join one of the groups as they listen to speakers debate some issue. Walk over and do some pull-ups at the gymnasium. Find a quiet spot in the shade and digest your meal in peace. Re-enter the temple and visit the main exhibits. Um, well, let's go, let's go with the first one. Join one of the groups as they listen to speakers debate some issue. On Greatness You approach the crowd and take a seat on a nearby rock. Nobody notices your approach, or if they do, they don't give any indication of it. Everyone is watching two speakers. As far as you can tell, they are arguing about some ethical or political issue. And if they can get you to fear something, you will obey them. Those who instill the sense of fear will also explain how you ought to avoid it. It's a variation on the good cop, bad cop routine. So like I said, fear is the chief factor that stops a man from achieving greatness. Writ large, a fearful society values safety and is easily manipulated by others. Without a willingness to roll the dice, Without the confidence to assert their will, how can anyone or any nation hope to be great? That is the true answer. The other man struts forward and gives his response. A nice speech, but fear is only part of the puzzle. You fail to see the forest for the trees. You might convince me that man has an inherent sense of fear that can be preyed on. But how does a nation have a sense of fear? In your example, the nation has leaders who presumably inspired the fear in the commons. The leaders would not feel constrained by whatever threat they promoted. If anything, they would feel emboldened by the increased control over their flock. So at best, fear is only a partial expl explanation, applicable to only part of the puzzle. Listen to my speech if you want to know the truth of the matter. Greatness is defined by its context, if a man's world consists of his immediate family and iron rice bowl, then how would he define greatness as anything other 
than preserving the peace in his home and consistently performing a minor professional function. If the nation regards itself as only concerned with maintaining the status quo, what ambition would it have beyond maintaining friendly diplomatic relations and avoiding internal change or strife. If you want something more significant, you must broaden the context. The individual must add new dimensions to his worldview, a sense of morality and culture that he can use to develop himself beyond his immediate practical functions. He will be inspired to make the world conform to his vision of the ideal order. His new perspective will impact his decision-making, it will impact what it is he fears and how he responds to any such fear. For the nation, it is much the same. Externally, the nation will seek to bring about an international order that will promote its culture and values. It will seek to create an ideal citizenry that can embody the national values and give rise to a state of lasting eunomia. To flourish, one's considerations must go beyond reproduction and a manual trade. Only when one is seriously concerned with honouring the philosophical, cultural and multi-generational can one achieve any significant measure of greatness. Without that, one is a natural-born helot, no different than the serfs we have working the fields just a short distance away. Whether that sort is afraid will be irrelevant. The spiritual helots will always work the fields and give the true citizenry their cut. That is all serfs aspire to in life. For a nation to flourish, its considerations must go beyond maintaining the status quo. Its culture and values will define its greatness. It will elevate its citizenry, so the people will resemble that which they love. It will be a hegemon. It will ensure that the international environment is one that naturally accommodates and complies with its vision. So there you have it. The thing that stops us from achieving true greatness is the breadth of our thought. Those who open their eyes are destined for greatness. There are other speakers lined up, but it seems they have decided to take a brief recess before continuing. You could take the opportunity to stretch your legs and follow one of the nearby trails. Re-entering the temple and visiting the exhibits might be interesting too. Choices. Check out one of the hiking trails. Make your way back to the main exhibits. Um, let's go on the hiking trail. We could go back to the main exhibits, which is when we listened to the uh, the monologue in the dark and that person came out and asked us to follow him, that's where the main exhibits are. Only now a few things have happened, so it's going to be different there now. Um, I'm not sure if the original guy is going to be there still, but let's just go on the trail. We don't need to bother with it. Let's read through. Check out one of the hiking trails. An afternoon hike. After spending much of the day in conversation... You decide to be alone with your thoughts. The weather is pleasant and the temple grounds are apparently open to exploration, so you begin walking down a nearby trail. The area is a lot more expansive than you anticipated. The trail is not hard to follow, but it rolls on well into the distance, with several branching paths. Fishing out the welcome guide from your pocket, you flip it over and take another look at the map. After a few minutes, you manage to piece together your general location. It seems the temple grounds are surrounded by a significant number of mountains and streams. In theory, you can follow the path as it tracks along next to a stream before winding up into the mountains. The guide doesn't provide much information about the flora and fauna, but you are able to enjoy the scenery all the same. The dirt trail is covered in fallen leaves, twigs, and the occasional pine cone. Every so often, you catch sight of a rocky stream, but for the most part the trail is surrounded on both sides by hills and deep green foliage. The trees are tall and narrow, with thick bark, and you can hear the sound of some unseen number of birds singing to each other. Are they birds? And is it a single stream that runs parallel to your trail? Or just a series of small, independent ponds gurgling with unseen activity? It's hard to say from your perspective. After the day's conversations, you know better than to deny the existence of this experience, the sound and the visuals. But to say it is necessarily a choir of birds, or one long stream, that claim may be a bridge too far. After all, 
You didn't observe or otherwise experience all those details. You are instead drawing a complete picture based on a few data points. What other pictures could you draw? Perhaps the local authorities have put speakers up in the trees. All these sounds might be generated by a computer. Or perhaps there are different bird watchers hiding in tree blinds, each intermittently blowing bird whistles and mistaking each other's responses as genuine. Neither one seems likely, but can you rule them out as incoherent? To do that with certainty would require a great deal of knowledge, and would that knowledge be sufficient to eliminate even more fanciful accounts? Sure, maybe there are birds in the trees rather than speakers, but maybe the entire complex is a sort of zoo. The birds, the trees, the stream, they were all placed here before you were born, to simulate a familiar human environment. You were lured in here by the scent of knowledge, and now something is peering down at you from the dark space between the stars. Why even place it in such a familiar spatial context? Perhaps it is in another dimension. It can watch you, but you do not know how to return the gaze. What understanding will you gain that will enable you to absolutely rule out such a scenario? Will it also allow you to say that this trail will definitely be here tomorrow? Maybe someone will tell you that they have walked this trail many times. Maybe you will come to be familiar with it. Yet whether you walk it once or a thousand times... Who will say with certainty that it will be there for the next stroll? Still, whatever you grasp exists, that much is certain. It is a challenge to describe it all accurately, to know how far to go with one's conclusions, but you can be unshakably certain that it all is. Whatever good that will do you, should a tear rip open in the space between objects and an alien appendage reach out to grab you. Whatever conclusion you reach, whatever model you draw, you suspect that you will always be wrestling with uncertainty when trying to grab hold of something beyond the immediate. Perhaps you must expand the immediate, or perhaps reason can tell you the path will not leave without some cause. Yet when all that is possible is necessary, the cause is mere possibility, and that hammer is too broad to nail any one particular thing down. Although, if it is possible for the path to be here tomorrow, you can be certain it will be so. Only, which tomorrow? The one where it is, or the other one that might be possible? Why do you have to figure it out? Surely you can rely on the adherents to tell you the answer. The walk becomes a hike, and you start to tire long before any unseen alien appendage kidnaps you. Apparently safe from any extra-dimensional entity, you eventually find yourself at a crossroads. A wooden sign indicates two options. A trail leading to the Heroa, and a path leading to the more distant guest house. A third option presents itself, a narrow trail leading up into the mountains. But the sign does not provide any information about what might await you there. As you consider your options, you scan the mountain trail to see if it is a genuine path. You can't see the end of it, but you do see some activity a short distance away. The tails of many foxes poke up above the bushes that line the trail. You cannot see their bodies, but they appear to be close together and racing away from you. Choices Continue the hike and see where the foxes are going. Page 234 uh, Visit the Heroa uh, Go to the guest house uh, let's go go directly to the guest house. Okay, so we've done our hike. Let's um, let's go to the guest house. Guest house. You slowly make your way down a narrow outdoor trail towards the guest house. Upon arrival, you find yourself standing before a central multi-story hotel. The surrounding area is forested, but you can see wood cabins sprinkled throughout nearby clearings. A group of people has gathered outside one of the larger cabins. From where you stand, you can make out that they are having a lively discussion of some sort. Turning your attention back to the guest house, you open the door and step inside. The entrance room is laid out like a regular hotel lobby. An overly excited clerk stands behind a wooden desk, waving and smiling at you. 
Welcome to the guest house. We were expecting you. We have your room ready, number 42. We've put you in the unaffiliated suites. They're somewhat Spartan, but it will certainly keep you warm and dry. If you let us know your philosophical beliefs and interests, we can try matching you with some of the other guests tomorrow. Typically, we get groups of people who give us these details ahead of time. Often people visit as part of a larger philosophical group or school. We try to accommodate them together in the cabins and provide some entertainment and conversation. I think it improves our experience, or at least brings people out of their shells and inspires them to examine our philosophical views in good faith. You could try tagging along with one of the groups if you like, although I suspect that things will be a tad hectic tomorrow. In fact, right now we have some entertainment planned for the group you saw outside. They call themselves Platonists. They're enjoying some food and drink we provided for them, but there is a, they're about to discover there's more on the menu than a good meal you might find the proceedings amusing. I'm sure you're tired though, so feel free just to call it a night. No need to get up early either. Breakfast is served all the way into the early afternoon. Eggs with all the trimmings. Perfect way to start the day, assuming there are no interruptions. If that's not to your liking, we also have a dim sum option. Served in a crowded room full of screaming people, as is tradition. Anyway, I've talked your ear off. I love greeting new visitors, which is no doubt why the adherents order me to man the front desk. Here's your room key. Just head down the corridor to the right and follow the signs. You take the key and thank the clerk for heading off to find your room. Wandering down the corridor, you notice a lively debate being held in a conference room. The day is not yet over. You could try listening in on the debate, or perhaps go back outside and see what surprise the Platonists are about to encounter choices. Go watch the debate. Go outside to watch the entertainment. Continue to your room and call it a night. Well, we could just go call it a night and end it here, but um, let's let's go outside and watch the entertainment. Let's see what's going to happen to the Platonists. Page 192. Let's see. Here we go. Puppet show. You head back to the lobby and step outside, giving a polite nod to the clerk. The area is forested, but you can make out cabins nestled throughout several small clearings, all connected by dirt trails. The Platonists you spotted earlier are still gathered outside one of the cabins, loudly chatting amongst themselves. They are seated at a large wooden table. It looks like they're enjoying some food and drink to go with their conversation. As you make your way towards them, you are startled by the sound of rustling leaves and snapping branches. You stop in your tracks as an old pot-bellied man comes tumbling out of the tree line between you and the group. He jumps to his feet and immediately rushes towards the Platonists, waving a rubber chicken above his head and squeezing it repeatedly. An obnoxious sound blares out with each squeeze, grabbing the group's attention. Their facial expressions display a mixture of confusion and amusement. How do you do, fellow sophists? I hope we are not too late. My foul friend and I are hungry for conversation and food. Don't think to refuse us either, for we know you are fans of Socrates. We only wish to live up to his example, for we understand he spent his life attending the finest banquets and parties in Athens. Your master, Socrates' student, also owes my esteemed friend here an apology. Maybe you recognize my friend, He is known to history as Gorgias. The newcomer waves the rubber chicken around once more, squeezing out a couple of mournful honks. The bird itself looks as one might expect, but someone has gone to the trouble of dressing it in a tunic. You decide to stand some distance behind the man and enjoy the show. You see, my friend Gorgias read some of the Socratic fan fiction you love to pass around. In particular the ridiculous transcript that now goes by his name. It's one thing to fantasize about winning an imaginary debate, another to put it in writing and distribute it to others. Thankfully, we are willing to consider it water under the bridge. You need only share a few plates of grub and enough wine to quench our thirst. Think of it as an opportunity to do something new. Instead of putting words into the mouths of others, you can put food there instead. 
With that introduction, the man grabs a handful of olives from the table and begins stuffing them into his face. The group laughs nervously. Eventually, one of them reaches out a hand to greet the stranger. Welcome, my name is Honk Honk. The man squeezes the bird twice more for good measure. Honk Honk. Please, I must eat something before you put me to sleep with formalities. I'll answer your questions, but first introduce yourself to the esteemed Gorgias. He has done you a great honour by attending this party in such a lovely tunic. Yet, do you deserve this? Is it not true that you all share and discuss a scandalous text about him? Here, I will raise Gorgias up so you can look him in the eye when you respond. The Platonist sighs deeply before addressing Gorgias directly. There is indeed a dialogue by that name, although how one might scandalize a sophist, I do not know. I'm sorry it was not to your liking, but that suggests your nature is other than that of a true philosopher. If you have such a low opinion of sophists, why spend your days reading Socratic dialogues? Socrates was regarded as a sophist by his fellow citizens, no? He was part of that generation in Athens given to focusing on social and ethical questions and developing particular methods of communication. He also went around bickering with the leading statesmen and noble scions. Socrates had a sense of morality that guided his behavior. He sought to know what is truly good. In dealing with his friends and followers, he did not promise them anything ridiculous or charge them money for his teachings. He possessed a steadfast desire for absolute truth and beauty. The sophists never had such honest motivations, hence Socrates' superiority and opposition to them. Whether he possessed such a character, and whether he was uniquely opposed to the class of sophists, is perhaps a worthy topic of debate. I have heard that his morality did not stop him from being affiliated with some of the most scandalous characters of the time. Also, his opposition to other sophists seems to be a trait common to that group. They love to compete against each other. It practically defined them. That spirit is present whenever philosophy is young and full of life. Money is a funny thing too, for on the one hand, if Socrates produced something valuable, perhaps he should have treated it as such. On the other hand, let's not pretend that Socrates lived a life of poverty. He was attached to the most famous and powerful people in Athens. He attended the finest parties, he had access to the best food, wine, and entertainment. He even had rich benefactors ready to cover his debts or help him flee the city and resume life elsewhere. Even if we say that Socrates did not lust for the personal possession of money, he no doubt lusted after influence, attention, and the good life, to the extent that it got him killed. Such an unfortunate end found many of his associates, too. But let's focus. When you allege that Socrates had a genuine sense of morality, are you denying this was the case with Gorgias? You know I am. Gorgias' character is well known. Everywhere you look, the differences are clear. Socrates was always seeking truth and beauty. His conduct at the end of his life was exemplary. His love of philosophy and what is right allowed him to overcome all fear of death. Gorgias was a totally different creature, one unable to appreciate any lasting truth. He was a sort of ambitious musician. He bent people to his will by stringing words together in a way that pleased their ear. In lieu of teaching people correct answers, he taught them the dangerous art of persuasion so that they could make a weak argument appear the stronger, regardless of truth. Gorgias did not die for his principles because his profession was the art of of rejecting set principles in favor of immediate desires. Not so fast. Take a step back and consider whether you are right to say everywhere you look. For you are looking in a very particular place, the fictional dialogues of your master, Plato. To the extent that those writings truly belong to him, of course, for Plato labored under contemporary accusations of fraud and plagiarism. Don't just take my word for it. Look at those who leveled such serious allegations, such as Theopompus, Antisthenes, and others. But to continue, 
Let's focus on the particular example you offered. What they would do when faced with death. You said that Socrates' love of philosophy allowed him to overcome all fear and do what is right, whereas Gorgias did not die for any substantial principles. Right off the bat, isn't it odd that you praise Socrates, the man who was killed by his own countrymen, while faulting Gorgias, the man who lived a full life and passed away naturally? Whether one dies naturally or unnaturally, the point remains that Socrates clung to his principles and bravely accepted death. Everyone knows the dialogues, the apology, Crito, Phaedo. Yes, but do they know an earlier work, Gorgias' defense of Palamedes? It would be interesting if Gorgias, in defending Palamedes, put forward the image of a person who was willing to die for what is right, who would reject the idea of giving up his good name and fleeing to some foreign land. In that case, perhaps Socrates learnt something from Gorgias. Or should I say, the one who painted the idealized portrait of Socrates borrowed that image from Gorgias's superior example. So let's review. Gorgias drafted a speech in defense of Palamedes who was framed for treason by Odysseus. The noble statements of Palamedes bear a striking resemblance to those we find uttered by Socrates in your cherished dialogues. Palamedes expresses his love of honour, which he roots in goodness. He holds that the highest sort of honour is wisdom. To the notion that he could flee to foreign people and live among them, he is resolutely opposed. To do so would be abandoning everything important, giving up the noblest honours, losing all credibility, and passing life in shameful disgrace. Perhaps it was Gorgias, then, who taught these things to Socrates or his scriptwriter. In which case, how ironic that you hold up your favourite version of Socrates while condemning the source of his wisdom. We can find other examples if the need arises, Socrates' behaviour at trial may be compared to that of Palamedes, directly questioning Odysseus, or to the numerous ancient works drafted by skilled orators and logographers. But Palamedes lived many centuries before Gorgias. That speech was not written out of genuine personal conviction or any immediate concern. Is there any length to which you won't go in your effort to paint Gorgias as some monster? Gorgias's speech on Palamedes was not attached to the original case. That is true. Yet in his freedom to draft a defense, he did not put forward some objectionable relativistic nonsense. Instead, he held fast to a moral standard and refuted the charges in a way consistent with the dignity of a gentleman whose behaviour is derived from his principles. If we had time, we might also compare their associates. Socrates had a number of notorious friends. Who shall we pick? Who is your favourite? Alcibiades, A man who was accused of almost every outrageous act, including sex with his own mother, sister and daughter. Maybe a safer choice. Plato. Yet his wisdom proved worthless in Sicily, fatal even for Dion. Whereas for Gorgias, we may pick Isocrates, a man whose pan-Hellenic project against the Mede saw a spark in Agesileos and ultimate success in Alexander. But as an olive branch, I admit that Gorgias and Socrates share the failure named Critias. At any rate, I'll be satisfied if you simply treat all the sophists in a more reasonable and unbiased fashion. You hear the Platonist exhaled loudly, pursing his lips and affecting a most displeased look. It is not long before a younger companion of his speaks up, but he is immediately silenced by loud honks from Gorgias. If you wish to continue talking about my friend, we require more food. Please, let's live up to the memory of Socrates and his friends. More food and drink. We must honour the veritable Heracles of philosophy. I smell some lamb. What is this? Everyone watches as the man leans across the table and pulls back the foil from a container. 
Within, fragrant cuts of lamb and roast potatoes are exposed. The pleasing smell soon reaches everyone. What do we have here? In philosophy, you disguise your beliefs by assigning them to others. In dining, you hide the tastiest portions from your guests by keeping them covered. Such strange practices. I have so much to learn when it comes to platonic culture. As a man grabs a slice of lamb and bites into it, the young Platonist speaks up again. My reason for reading Plato and his students is that they present me with a broad account of reality that justifies their particular teachings. I don't want to watch someone paint a pretty and convenient ethical picture when all that lies below is personal ambition. I want to discuss the normative standard by which something may be deemed desirable or repulsive. If I must talk to your ridiculous friend Gorgias, I want to go beyond even that. I want to discuss metaphysics with you both. For isn't it true that Gorgias denies that anything exists? He not only denies that there are many things, he denies that there is even one thing. So how can you be here talking to us when we are nothing? If having questionable metaphysics is sufficient to be a target of malice, then perhaps you no longer owe my friend an apology. <laughs> Yet, your master himself would be all the more deserving of the scorn I heap upon him, for his metaphysics, to the extent we may assume he came up with it, and to the extent you can piece it together from these disparate dialogues, is itself an unfortunate collection of errors. Perhaps you heard as much over at the canteen. There was a crowd discussing it. How could anything in these dialogues be worse than what your friend has written? The bag of air who literally denies that anything exists, whose understanding of the world amounts to nothing. Ask my friend. Where his attempts at reason wander astray, I will happily lead him back to the Eleatics. Gorgias's metaphysical work did not consist solely of some bold declaration that all is nothing. Instead, he gave voice to his doubts. He argued in the alternative that if things exist, then they are unknowable. He further doubted that, arguing again in the alternative that if they are knowable, they cannot be communicated. So he might say that he favours nothing, but he did not chain himself to that position, shutting his ears to reason. In fact, He's closer to the Eleatic position than you might suspect. My friend is only one step removed from Parmenides and Melissus, as noted by Isocrates. Parmenides and Melissus said it is one, and Gorgias, none at all. Further, given that Gorgias is presenting some account, perhaps we need to be more careful and consider what terms like none at all mean in that context. <clears throat> Your friend's a ridiculous rubber chicken. I haven't seen Gorgias all day. So I would have you speak plainly and defend the Gorgian nothingness. We gave you food. Now give us something of substance. Yes, you gave me food that we gave to you. Much like Socrates would pay fines with other people's money. Good to see that you still keep old traditions alive. As you wish, I'll have that conversation with you. I'll even give you an education at the same time. Gorgias did not just present his conclusion, but rather worked his way through a three-stage process. Specifically, whether anything exists, whether we can know about what exists, and whether we can communicate what we know. So how shall we make our way through this maze? As the conversation switches tracks, the man grabs a large piece of potato and takes a bite. While chewing, he turns to you and invites you to weigh in. What do you say, my shadow? You stood here in silence this whole time. I did not bother you earlier, because I feared you might disappear if I focused on you directly. Yet now I must take the risk. The food is slowing me down. I need you to hold my hand and lead me through this maze. Which path will prove the most fruitful? Do we fear that there might be nothing at all? Or are we on surer footing, but still in fear that whatever this is, we cannot know it, or at least... We cannot communicate it to each other. Or even worse, did you not complete the reading assignment? 
Have you and the rest of this group failed to carefully review the greatest metaphysical masterpiece ever penned by a feathered biped? Choices. Express concern that everything might be nothing. Express fear about whether we can know and communicate. Confess that you have not read the work. Um, I'm going to go with not having read the work. In part because the work is no longer extant. But actually I did my best to piece it together. So we're going to go and uh, tell them we haven't, we haven't read it. And then uh, see what we can learn about it. Enjoying the fruits. You throw your hands up in mock surrender, hastily explaining that you are not related to the group and didn't receive any such assignment. The man ignores your excuses, making a show of disbelief. At the same time, he loads up a plate of food and hands it to you, insisting that you eat something. Sitting down, you begin to quietly tuck into the meal, hoping to avoid further attention. Unfortunately, the man has other ideas. Incorporating you into his performance, he raises his voice and wanders around, berating the Platonists. Oh, don't let me interrupt your dinner. Surely a nice meal is more important than the metaphysical status of all reality. This one says he hasn't read the work of the great Gorgias. How about the rest of you? Or do you just talk about immediate practical concerns? Metaphysics, that won't keep you warm at night. Nobody has ever served the nature of reality for dinner. So true. Still, you need some sort of context for your practical activities, no? Some standard to determine your goals and decisions? We're humans. We are proud because we can think beyond our immediate actions. So while we all focus on satisfying our appetites, we should still take a moment to give thanks to those who would offer assistance in drawing the bigger picture. The man turns back to you and winks, before reaching into his grubby clothes and withdrawing a stack of papers. He throws them on the table before addressing the crowd once more. Yeah, for those of you who didn't do the reading, there's enough copies to go around. You'll forgive me if I don't stay to watch you all flip through the pages, trying your best to catch up. I merely came to make Plato's troglodytes doubt his illusions. Any education beyond that will have to wait. My friend and I have more dinners to interrupt. But don't worry, I said that I'll engage with you in a metaphysical discussion, and I remain true to that. Only, I did not say when. The man suddenly spins around, lurching towards the table. In one swift movement, he tucks Gorgias under one arm and sweeps several bottles of wine off the table with the other. Before anyone can object, he dashes off into the forest. You grab a copy of the text and place it in your inventory. As you do so, you catch sight of the title, A Gorgian Work. Members of the group shuffle over and grab the remaining copies. It seems a few of them have read it but the overwhelming majority are seeing it for the first time. They politely acknowledge you, but otherwise keep to themselves, quickly reading over the text between bites and conversing in low voices about its contents. After you've had your fill, you quietly make your way back to the guest house. Return to your room at the guest house, page 289. Well, while we're walking there, let's um, let's go take a look at the the Gorgian work, or a Gorgian work. So we're going to go down to the inventory. Wait, what page was that first? I don't want to lose my page on this Word file. All right. So we're going to go down to 290, check the inventory. Gorgian work, 306. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so while we're walking back to the guest house, let's just uh, skim this. A Gorgian work. You carefully unfold the document and begin to review its contents. Just scanning this, I see that it's... What? Okay, it's it's several pages long. I'm just going to read the um, the first section of this. You'll see it's in three sections. On the non-existent or... On nature. I, Gorgias, the most famous and brilliant of rubber chickens, do hereby declare, nothing at all exists. Even if something exists, it is unknowable. Even if it is knowable, it cannot be expressed or explained to others. 
To those creatures more simple-minded than the noble race of rubber chickens, I provide the following explanation on the first point. If something exists, either A, it is the existing thing that exists, or B, the non-existent thing that exists, or C, both types of things exist. Regarding the existent, if an existing thing exists, it is either eternal or generated, or both. If eternal, it does not have a beginning, therefore it has no limit, and that which has no limit is nowhere. For if a thing is somewhere, it is in some container. But if it has no limit, then it can't fit into a container. For on the one hand, a limited container could not fit the unlimited. And on the other hand, we cannot have two unlimited things, the existent and the container, because they would limit each other. Further, it cannot be in itself, for something cannot be both the container and the contained. That would make it place and body, that would make place and body the same, which is nonsense. Therefore, it is nowhere, and what is nowhere does not exist. If generated, it has to come from either the existent or the non-existent. If from the existent, then that which exists must already exist. Also, if it then changes or becomes, it would become something different than what exists. To instead say that it comes from the non-existent is also nonsense, because whatever generates something must have some positive existence of its own. If it is both eternal and generated. This is impossible, because the eternal and the generated are exclusive attributes. To posit both would be a contradiction. Therefore, the existent does not exist. Regarding the non-existent. The non-existent cannot exist, because if it did, that would be a contradiction. It is existing, while by definition not existing. A saying that it is that which is not. Further, to any extent that we might treat it like the existent, it fails for the reasons given regarding eternal and generated existence. Therefore, the non-existent does not exist. Regarding both existing and non-existing existing. Impossible because they're opposites in terms of existence. For example, if we say the non-existent exists, then the existent would not exist, as they are opposites on this point. If we want to say the existent and the non-existent are the same in terms of existence, but we agree that the non-existent does not exist, then the same would follow for the existent. If we say both these opposites exist, then the non-existent would be no less existent than the existent, and so we contradict ourselves and fail to distinguish the existent or non-existent. Therefore, both cannot exist together. Additional argument. If something exists, it is either one or many. If it exists, it has some magnitude or shape. Whatever has such a feature is divisible into parts, and therefore is not one. Also, where it can be divided, at that point there, it is not. If it is not one, it cannot be many, because what is many is constituted of distinct individual entities or units. But if there is no one, then there cannot be the units needed to constitute the many and therefore it is not many. Therefore, nothing at all exists. On the second point, I'm not going to read the rest of this um, amalgamation of ancient sources, really. Um, it goes on for another few pages, but you can see it argues in the second point, um, that alternative, and then the third point is the other alternative. Uh, again, drawing on... Um, two ancient sources in particular.
but I, I pieced this together. I wrote this, but it's drawing heavily on two quite extensive ancient sources. The document itself is no longer extant, so I can't, it's not there to be translated and presented to you. I had to write it myself and, and do this, but it's, it, it's all drawing upon second-hand accounts from antiquity of Gorgias's work. And, you know, the, the, these two sources in particular, there are some others that color in some of the details, but these two main sources are fairly close to each other. Some of them raise issues or make observations that the other doesn't. So you kind of have to take both at once and uh, amalgamate them together if you want to know as much as you possibly can about the text. But uh, that's what I've done here, and hopefully it informs anyone or is helpful for anyone that wants a quick uh, reconstruction of Gorgias's metaphysical treatise. But where were we? We were walking back to the guest house. So let's um, let's enjoy. I'm just uh, getting us back to that point. Here we go. Return to your room at the guest house. Page 289. All right. Restful slumber. After finally reaching your room, you quickly wash up and then collapse on the bed. As you get comfortable under the sheets, you think about all the projects you are working on and how you might find time to complete them. It's always nice to produce some work, something you can pass around and share with others. Only, you stop yourself before too long, lest you keep yourself awake all night. You are exhausted by the day's activities, and it sounds like you will need plenty of energy for tomorrow. Before turning the bedside lamp off, you decide to seek out the answer to one last question. What book does an Eliadic guesthouse place in the bedside drawer? Pulling it open, you spot a decent-sized tome entitled Elea. You crack it open and give it a quick scan before finally calling it a night. Close the book and continue your adventures elsewhere. Your friends will always be here for you, everywhere they have always been.